let's face it, we can't get the best results without the best team. Today we're talking about managing the risk of getting and keeping the right who's on our team. Welcome to the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. Welcome to the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. We are here each week to talk about leadership, teamwork, organizational culture, and human potential with experts from every walk of life. Your host is Kevin Eikenberry, a best-selling author and leadership thought leader for 25 years. This episode is sponsored by Kevin's book, The Long Distance Leader, Rules for Remarkable Remote Leadership. Order your copy today at remarkablepodcast.com forward slash book. And now, here's your host, Kevin. Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome. It may not be morning where you're listening, but it's morning here for me. And it's actually morning for Steve, too. Uh, Good morning to uh, you all as we start another episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. My guest today is Steve Troutman. We're going to get started with him in a second, but man, we're so glad that you're here. And we're going to talk about uh, a topic today that we've never talked about in nearly 150 episodes here. Uh, But let me introduce my guest first before we get started. Uh, Our guest today is Steve Troutman. Uh, From Microsoft to Expedia, Steve Troutman's corporate experience speaks for itself. The author of three books, he's become a thought, excuse me, sought after expert in the fields of knowledge transfer and talent risk management. His latest book, Do You Know Who It Takes? Managing Talent Risk in a High Stakes Technical Workforce, offers revolutionary yet practical ideas for every level of an organization, including the corporate board, so that you can manage talent risk with clear, measurable, and relevant data. Uh, Most executives don't know they can manage talent risk with the same rigor they use to manage corporate finances, legal risk, or inventory. Armed with the right data, they can spot hidden skill gaps, overlaps, and critical points of failure. Talent risk data reveals whether you've got the right technical bench strength to get quality products to market on time. I told you it's a topic we haven't talked about before. Steve, welcome. I'm so glad that you're here. Thanks, Kevin. It's my pleasure. Uh, Before I hit record, Steve said, well, I want to get people to hear about talent risk management because they really haven't heard that before. I'm like, you're right. And so uh, I'm so excited. We got the guy that came up with the language, wrote the book, and we're going to dive into that because, you know, it is a topic we haven't really talked about. But Steve, we have so many listeners and we have so many clients that are in technical companies, whether that's high tech or whether that's engineering firms, all sorts of folks that have highly technical folks, highly technical team members. And it's a, it's a challenge that, that organizations need to think about, especially in this time as we record this of super full employment. And sure. so I'm excited that we're taking slightly, slightly different direction this week. And um, before we get into the book and talk about the language and all that, uh, tell us about your journey. I mentioned briefly the Microsoft background, but tell us a little bit of how you got to the place of being the expert in talent risk management. <laughs> well, I, I grew up at Microsoft in the early 90s. I was uh, uh, hired to manage the localization of Word 1.0 in uh, German, French, Spanish, Italian, and Portuguese. I was uniquely unqualified for that job. I, I had no technical background whatsoever. We were building the industry from scratch, so a lot of people are just hired to come in and kind of figure it out. And uh, my team was from all over the world. All of us were basically non-technical, but came in to, to do this pretty technical work. And uh, we had to learn our jobs by going to work, and like everybody does. And I know, surprise. And, uh, but you know, we had to learn from our coworkers, which is what everybody does. But our coworkers were engineers. And when they talked, we couldn't understand anything they said. And it wasn't German or Portuguese. It, right. <laughs> exactly. But it felt like it, right? By the way, before you continue, I have to just say, at that point, did they call it Word 1.0 or was it just Word? This is Word for Windows. Okay. And, oh, right. I see. <laughs> yeah. We it call was, it Word 1.0 now, but it, it was just Word for Windows, right? Right. It was, it was actually late. You know, there was the, the DOS version. So this was, uh, this was Word for Windows 1.0. Exactly. <laughs> I remember. The yeah, just it was a, uh, yeah, that means you're as old as I am. That's, that's, that that's, what, yeah, that's what it is. You actually, Steve. <laughs> so you started out in Microsoft, started doing all that stuff. So take, I, I interrupted you, finish, finish that, that tack just a little bit more. 
Well, I, I decided uh, just really uh, for my own benefit, I would try to teach these engineers how to be teachers so that they could teach the rest of us how to do our jobs. And so we call it knowledge transfer now, but you know, really at that point, it was really just, can you, can you shut up and stop talking like a nerd and explain yourself to the rest of us? And uh, they, were, they, they really took to it. And so I ended up running training for everybody who ships software at Microsoft uh, because I kept solving training problems. And then uh, uh, when I left the company, uh, the ideas that I had there, that they didn't want to own them, so they gave them to me and they allowed me to sell them back to the company and that was the beginning of my practice and um so that was the beginning of knowledge transfer and and uh got a chance to go to expedia for a few years to just run, i ran their advertising business units just more opportunity to get more experience in a, a great corporate setting and then um the, the notion of talent risk management came because we kept solving knowledge transfer problems but people would say well how do we decide who to transfer knowledge from and how do we decide to, how can we make sure that we have enough data to make sure we're tracking that people are actually learning and that we're gonna have the capacity we need one to three years from now. So, uh, so talent risk management was born out of that. I, I was at a nuclear plant in Southern California and talking to the head of engineering for the whole plant and he was lamenting the number of engineers who were you know, retiring. And, and uh, so we talked about gathering data on those folks, you know, who does what work where and, what is the, the technical uh, capacities that we have to replace, not just the job titles, but the technical capacities. And so that's where this all came from. Uh, so we've been doing it for 20, 25 years now. Well, so that I think is a really important part. You're, you're not just thinking about, and we all shouldn't just be thinking about job titles, but the actual work, the actual knowledge that's really going on, because listen, we all know the job titles are like, they are what they are. Um, so you've started to say this, but, uh, but make sure that we all sort of know what you mean when you yeah. say talent risk. What is talent yeah. risk? Sure. So every executive, uh, really every leader at every level has a charter. You know, they, they call it a strategy or they call it a business plan, but they have, they have what I'm going to be doing for the next one to three years laid out in front of them. And the question with talent risk management answers is, you know, do you have the technical and professional capacity to actually deliver on that plan? And can you prove it? You know, can you say it in plain language? So talent risk management is managing the risk that you'll fail to execute on, you know, your plan. Well, so that ought to be something we ought to all be interested in. And I'm afraid I'm going to sneeze. So if I do, I apologize in advance. <laughs> um, but I will say this. I love that you said um, that you said this isn't just for executives, although I'm guessing most of your clients are, and, and, and probably the, the perfect reader of the book is, and yet this applies to all of us. And so sure. you're here and many of you who are listening or watching are not executives. Doesn't mean that you should shut this one off and go find a different podcast. It just means that you should pay attention and think about how you connect it. Because I think as we go through this conversation, it, we will definitely connect the dots for you. So one of the things I love about the book, and we're talking about, Steve's book, Do You Have Who It Takes? And uh, you, you open the book with a bunch of myths. I think there are eight of them, talent myths. And I just wanted, as thinking about our listeners, um, and I thought, well, some of these I think will apply to all of us and will be sort of entertaining for us to talk about as you, as you dispel the myths. So I'm going to give you a few of these and let you talk about that. Is that all right? Sure. Sounds great. Okay. So the first one, and I don't remember if it, I think it actually is the first one, but um, is people issues myth people issues and hard data don't mix sure you know even the what language we use in the professionally is that we talk about soft skills and uh, so it, it, it makes it all sound like mystical or, or uh, some kind of a, a big mystery uh, but uh, it's, it's one of the reasons why I think most executives run away from HR issues in general is because it just it's just too hard. It just feels like it's too soft, too emotional, that sort of thing. But um, we found working with jobs that are as diverse as video gamers who 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 are responsible for making a game fun, uh, to people who are inventing products like uh, the next cookie or chocolate, uh, or people who are copper miners and their job is to blow up the side of the mountain, you know. Everybody, there's all these crazy roles that people think are all, you know, only art and there's, there's no way to talk about them in any other way. Um, and so we've just found over the years that we have a, we can really deconstruct the work 
and um, talk about it in plain language. And when we do that, it makes uh, executives and, and leaders at all level better able to kind of think of it as a problem to be solved rather than just uh, some kind of emotional mystery. Right, and it and it it gives them some hope. I think it sounds to me like it feels to that's me like our, that's, that's what we should do. Absolutely, maybe we can really do something here. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, myth number two: a reorg will solve our problem. <laughs> How many times have we, as leaders at all levels, really uh, been subject to a reorganization? You know, there'll be a new executive who comes in, they take over, they decide, oh, the problem here is that uh, everybody's just not sitting in the right chair, and so we're gonna we're gonna move them around. Uh, in fact, uh, just this week, working with a client who's doing a massive reorganization, at the end of the day, it does make sense. The reorgs often do make sense, but one of the problems is that. Is it uh, if you don't get to the end of the of the transition, you know, if people get stuck in the middle and the kind of the tornado or the blender of of craziness that goes on during a reorganization. Um, so usually, what happens in reorgs is we'll exhale everybody out so that they're you know sitting with their customers and they're de completely decentralized, or we'll inhale them and suck them back in and decide that they all have to sit with their coworkers. And uh, but at the end of the day, what we really need to do is be clear about what our expectations are of them and and give them a, a way to set clear standards and be able to follow each other down the path. Uh, and so, um, so oftentimes the, the or reorganization makes us feel good because we're doing something, but it rarely actually solves the problem. It only feels good to the people who are doing it, not the ones who it's done to. It's, just uh, saying. I, and and so, so everybody, I hope, as you're listening, whatever <laughs> you're doing, running on the treadmill or whatever, as you're listening, here's a key word that Steve said, expectations, clear expectations. I, I'm, I'm thinking, Steve, this, that, that idea shows up in nearly every single episode here one way or another. Why? Because yeah. it's a fundamental yeah. uh, foundational skill for us as leaders, and we don't do it nearly well enough. And I'm, so any, I've read enough of the book to know that there's a strong connection between that idea and everything else in the book. Can you say oh. more about that connection? Sure. You know, I mean... Um... Our work almost always has to do with change, right? Which is fundamental, right? People are going through big transitions. There's an acquisition, so they got to blend the families, or there's a reorganization, so they got to get people back to work, or they're standing up a new factory, so they got to get new people hired and into the slots, or people are retiring, and so you got to deal with that. And uh, you know, people can deal with the change um, much better if they're not don't spend all their time wondering what the heck you're talking about, or what you're doing, or what the outcome is going to be. So if you could just manage their expectations, that helps. And so. We have a tool that we use that, that is all about this. Uh, we call it the big picture. And it's a tool that's designed to kind of guide executives and really leaders, again, at all levels, to, um, to articulate uh, measurably uh, what the big picture is all about. And uh, we, we, we oftentimes will, will fire people who don't get the big picture. You know, we, we rever people who do get the big picture. But when we ask people, what the heck is the big picture, uh, it's oftentimes a little bit soft. And, and so, so the tool has helped helps to clarify it, make it less soft, more more tangible, et cetera. Completely measurable. If you can answer the big picture questions and sound like you're a leader, then you do in fact get the big picture. If you can't, you don't. All right, excellent. So I've got two more of the eight myths that All I right. thought we would talk about. Here's the next one. Um, my ex myth: my experts hoard their knowledge. Don't they? <laughs> don't yeah. the experts want to hoard, hold on to it and not let go of it? They'll say, his name is Joe. We don't really know what he does, but we're pretty sure if he stops, we're all going to die, right? So there's this, there's this uh, idea that, he, that their experts are, you know, again, mysterious, uh, that they've got their pixie dust they sprinkle around. And they, they really, they got that way because they don't want to help anybody. And the story I always tell is, uh, I was at uh, Boeing and there was an executive who said, there's, a, there's Joe over there in the corner. He, uh, he's brilliant. He's a genius. Uh, he, he hates people and he, he doesn't want to help anybody. And he, he really would like to be sitting in his chair uh, and, and he would like to die there. And between now and then he would like to be left alone. <laughs> so I bought the guy a cup of coffee. I said, did you know that they think that you hate people and you don't want to help anybody? And you know, did you know that they think you don't, you know, you're not interested in explaining what you know? And he gave me this big sigh and he said, dude, he said, he didn't say dude. He said, that wouldn't have been his language. But I heard him say is, you know, look, Steve, I, uh, I, uh, I've been here a long time. He said, when, when people uh, come and ask me questions, I, um, I, for years, I would actually try to answer them. You know, I would maybe spend a half a day with somebody, you know, drawing on the whiteboard and explaining myself. 
And they would, you know, usually at the end of a half a day, they would hate my guts and they would have learned absolutely nothing. So I decided after a while to skip the part where I uh, actually spend a half a day and I just go directly to, they hate, they hate my guts, you know, and they've learned nothing from me. And he said, more, furthermore, nobody cares what I know. Whose job is it to learn from me? Nobody. And then he said, and then they say, hey, can you put the kid in your pocket? Let him follow you around. I'm like, what does that mean? I've been here 40 years. What am I going to, you know, what part of my 40 years do you want me to teach? So these are all leadership questions. So if you, you know, if you're talking, if you are a leader at any level and you want uh, a true expert to replicate themselves, transfer their knowledge, uh, don't leave so much of it open to their devices, you know, so tell them what to teach, make it somebody's job to learn from them. Uh, tell them what not to teach. That's really, really helpful. That might be more important when they know that 40 years worth of stuff, right? How much of it's really relevant at this moment in time? You know, what is relevant is really critical, but there's so much that isn't. And, and then like, what they, do we want to be replicating in the future? Precisely, because so often, so often, you know, uh, you don't want to replicate bad habits. Uh, nobody does. And then the last thing is you got to give them some tools so they know how to teach. Because most, especially true experts, are oftentimes very technical not so good with the human condition. You know, they're not that great at, at talking. They don't like, the, it's, it's a little overwhelming to have a lot of human interaction. So, so if you can make it easy for them to um, explain themselves and, and all that. The other thing we do is we like to make sure that the apprentice, the learner, feels most of the responsibility. So oh. if, if you set people up that way, you'll, you'll take away that notion. I, I've been in this a long time, very few people. Uh, actually are unwilling to teach literally fewer than five in 20 plus years, you know, so it's, um, it's not, a, it's not, a, it's not true. You, but you've got to, you've got to give them clear expectations. You've got to equip them for success. And you've got to set expectations for the learner or the apprentice as well. And nice by, by the way, everyone who's listening, if you were wondering about what, <coughs> excuse me, what Steve was just saying about these people that, you know, they just, they know all this stuff and they're not really good at the human condition. You all had one of those in college. <laughs> we all had at least one of those professors who was brilliant, really, really good, didn't, wasn't a very good teacher. And so, Steve, there's a connective tissue between you and me because way back in my corporate days, I was responsible for training trainers at Chevron so many years ago. And so, and, and you know, I sort of built a practice there because I helped people figure out that that was strategically important. And it, it's really what you're doing in a, in a, in a different and a bigger sort of way. Maybe if I'd have stayed there, I'd have ended up being Steve Jr. I don't know, but I, I didn't, so I'm not. Um, last of the myths that I want us to talk about is myth. Our culture is too unique for this to work. Like that might work somewhere else, Steve, it ain't going to work for us. Yeah, of course your culture and your line of business and your issues are unique. Absolutely, for sure, that's true. I just want to point out that your more of you is the same then is different. That's it. Uh, you know, you're, if you, if you just take what is a human condition and I, I really, cause our clients are always global. So we have these issues all around the world. Uh, and I spent a big chunk of my life working cross-culturally. Um, yes, you're unique, but just, just don't make that the guiding factor. You know, talk about, talk about the ways in which you're the same as everybody else and you're going to go a long way. And because it's a lot more the same than different. It's the, it's the exactly. condition of the work that you and I do to, that we know that that is true. Yeah. Even though our clients don't want to believe it. Exactly. Um, so uh, we could both tell stories that <laughs> everyone else listening doesn't want to hear. I'm confident we could tell those stories. So in the book, I'm going to shift gears now. We've talked about four of the eight myths. That's enough mything, myth busting for the day. Um, there's a couple of there's a couple of other ideas from the book, and we are talking everybody with Steve Troutman, who is the author of "Do You Have Who It Takes: Managing Talent Risk in a High Stakes Technical Workforce." Um, so, you you devote a whole chapter to another phrase called technical fog. Talk to us about that. I got that was an idea worth us just exploring a little bit here. Just Talk imagine, yeah, just imagine the the challenge that a lot of leaders face when they have technical people who work for them, but the the people who work for them are far more technical than they as leaders are, which is almost always the case. And so the technical fog is just the notion that you know there is a there is a barrier between you as a leader and the people who work for you who are technical, and you need a way to see through that fog. You can't just shrug and say, well, it's hard to manage those people because they're technical. You have to have a framework for a conversation to discuss their technical work 
and to take away. And I, I mean, I had this experience both at Microsoft and Expedia and a company in between where um, the, the folks who worked for me ended up being far more technical than I was. And, you know, it, it, it's, it's tricky. So a lot of our work in talent risk management is giving a way for the very, very technical folks to explain themselves up and down the food chain and uh, allow that kind of what I call cutting through that technical fog. So as um, a leader, uh, so I've got two questions about that. Uh, the first one is as a leader, if, if someone's listening and that's them, like man, my folks are more technical than me. And I'm guessing all of us have at least somebody. I mean, I got people on my team that know stuff I don't know, that I don't really care to know. But my question is, how, what advice do you have for, for those of us leading folks more technical than us about, about opening that line of communication and making that happen. I mean, other than buying a copy of the book, which they need to do, what do they need to, what do they need to, what advice would you give us if we are living in that technical fog? How do we break through it? Yeah. I mean, uh, so I'll give you an example from a speech I gave a couple weeks ago in Texas. You know, the, the, um, the thing is you have to like Google earth zooms into the front door once in a while, you know, you don't always need to zoom into the front door, but, but uh, if you're a leader, you should know, for example, who are the three to five people who are going to make the difference between whether you're going to execute your strategy or not. You should know who the, what their names are and you should know what they do and you should be able to speak to it. Just be able to say, this is Mike. He's my go-to person for these uh, areas of technology. This is what he actually does. And this is what my, firm is my company, my team is doing to make sure that Mike is successful. Um, breaking their work down into chunks that are explicable is a really good idea. So we call them knowledge silos. It's just a, a block of work. So it's areas of expertise. Uh, and then making sure that there's uh, uh, backup for, for those people and the work that they do. And uh, this is tricky because we don't have extra headcount and everybody's running very lean. But being able to think about, you know, taking the, the work that's being done, uh, labeling it, talking about backups, and making sure that there is a um, uh, a clear path to, uh, to to take care of that person. One example we see all the time is um, uh, some of our best people are doing work that is uh, not the highest value. Uh, they're doing things that used to be part of their job, but they and they never were able to give them up because people keep asking. That's an example. Um, so. Uh, cutting through the technical fog in this situation can just be asking thoughtful questions about how they're spending their day and where they're wasting their time and, um, and, and uh, being able to pinpoint the people who are effectively your critical path. They're the ones who are slowing down your, your ability to execute your strategy. And if they were to leave, they, they could actually stop your ability to execute your strategy. So these are all just ways to think logically about those people. But as leaders, we oftentimes abdicate. We're just like, look, it's just too hard. It's too complicated. I'm too busy. I've got too many other things to deal with. And I always say, well, if you're going to put in one to four hours a month, how are you going to spend your time to make sure that the people part of your business is actually in good shape? So you used a word, you used a four letter word a little bit ago, Steve. It's uh, it, the word was lean. Well, we're lean. We don't have time. We don't have time. We don't have people to do that. My observation in doing this for a long time is people have been saying that forever. It feels an awful lot like an excuse, like the busy excuse, like, well, I'm busy. Yeah. Uh, well, we're lean. And yet I think, so I think the point is that we shouldn't use that as an excuse and we've got to figure out how to deal with that. And, you know, the research continues to show that people aren't as productive as they could be at work, lean, however lean we might be. Uh, so don't let that get in your way. Uh, don't let that become the excuse du jour for not doing some of the stuff that Steve's talking about or any of the, any of the other three or four other things that you ought to be doing that you're excusing away. Um, so we're talking about talent risk, talent risk management. Um, when we make a mistake here, in managing this like what's the cost of that talk a little bit about the other we've been talking about how to how to how to minimize it how to make it better but talk a little bit about the the dark side of this for a second in terms of the cost of mistakes here yeah so just the vocabulary the language of say talking about cost of a mistake is a really good way to create a little bit of urgency around solving this problem you know uh uh talent and dealing with the human problem is oftentimes not the easiest or clearest um problem to solve for a lot of organizations and so they push it to the side. What I recommend is, is quantifying the potential risk. 
with dollars and cents. So as an example, you know, sitting around talking to a bunch of procurement executives and, and uh, they've got, a, it's a global team, there's four vice presidents in the room, they represent six, 700 people who are doing procurement for this company that builds these floating oil rigs. And uh, so these are big buys, this is, they're not buying pencils and paper clips, right? And uh, when I asked about the mistakes that could happen if one of their experts stepped aside, re retired, got poached, whatever reasons why people leave every day right now, uh, they said, oh, that, that would be a $100,000 mistake uh, every single time. Well, how many people in the organization um, could make that mistake? Well, I've got probably 150 people who could make that mistake at any one time right now. Uh, okay, is that a material mistake? Well, for this organization, it was actually not that terrifying. They had contingency budget. Okay, well. Um, but what if you did, yeah. Right, there you go. You're making the face I wanted you to make. You know, it's like, okay, so. Yeah, I can make it to you, but you wouldn't make it to the client. Like, are you freaking kidding me? <laughs> so the thing is, is that if we can quantify it and we can talk about it, then we can then we can decide whether or not it is a material mistake. Is it worth a, a mistake worth solving? Don't solve the ones that are not that big of a deal. Look, we're not lo looking to, to put out every fire in the building. We're just trying to make sure that the biggest fires, you know, talent, risk management, like if we can, solve the biggest risks, then we, we can improve uh, uh, cash flow at the end of the day. That's what we're shooting for. So Steve, um, a wise person asked me uh, sometime after one, about actually about the time one of my books came out, this question, and your book has actually been out a while as we are having this conversation, even a little longer by the time everyone else is hearing it. Uh, but the wise person asked me this question, what have you learned since the book came out that you wished was in the book? So <laughs> tell us something that they can't get if they go read the book. Um, what's something that you wish was there or that you've learned since? Yeah, well, we, we've really learned that there's, um, one thing we've learned and I would like to write, and I'm writing about now, but it will probably show up in my next book, is the notion that talent comes in ecosystems. You know, that, that uh, sometimes we think about org charts and teams and, and that kind of thing, but oftentimes talent comes in ecosystems. There are groups of people, especially in global companies around the world who have jobs that are similar and they're having to interoperate a whole bunch. And so a lot of talent risk comes from when those ecosystems aren't functioning very well. People don't know uh, with whom they should be consistent. They don't know um, what they should stop doing. They don't know how uh, ways to spend less of their time uh, doing things that are no longer valuable. And uh, when we, when we, a lot of what we do in the data that we gather is we identify these ecosystems and we pull together reports and say, did you know that you got a uh, hundred people doing technical support at the front line in 17 locations around the country, around the world. And those people all report into different executives, but they all have effectively the same job and that they would benefit from operating in a more consistent way. And so calling them out as an ecosystem, labeling it, and then asking, is this a problem we should solve? And it turns out that quite often it is. Uh, and it gives uh, a community for those people, which is a good human thing to do, but it also gives a way to manage and measure whether or not uh, they're getting their job done well. And something like frontline technical support isn't very sexy, but guess what? That affects the, the, the productivity of every uh, you know, person in your entire company who calls help desk looking for help to try to get back to work. So uh, that's one of the things we've learned recently. It's been really fun to sort out and, and it's just another use of the same data we've been gathering, but it's an, and it's an, it leads another conversation, which is, which is what it's my pleasure to do. And it's so interesting that as you describe the things that they could, that, that the questions to help them answer, right? You didn't even answer the one that immediately came to my head, um, which doesn't necessarily mean mine's right. It just means that there's all this other great stuff. I think maybe the one that came to my head is the one that people might think of is like, well, how can I figure out who's doing this better than me? Like the benchmark question. Sure. You didn't even ask that one. You asked all these others that most of us probably never even considered, probably more important. Yeah, uh, I just found that interesting. And again, yeah. not not at all saying that, that that's the right one. No, it's just it's that's well, it's one of many. Like you know, it's one of many, and and it's crit. Our data absolutely tells people who is doing it better than they are. There, we should we. That's a, such an important point, Kevin, because you uh, you if if you're trying to give feedback and nobody knows who's doing it right, like who's doing the work the right way. Right, and so a lot of what everybody we, thinks they're the one doing it the right way. By well, the way. I don't know if that's true. I actually think they, they're some people do, and they're wrong. Yeah. But some people do, and they're, they're, they are doing it the right way, and nobody told them. So, so what we want to do is take the mystery out of that. Yeah, yeah, that's one of the things I always tell people. Why you ought to get? I mean, on an individual level, why you, one of the many reasons to give positive feedback is if you don't tell them they're doing it well, they might not know, and they might stop. Exactly. You really ought to do that. Hey, the next section of our 
of our of our conversation, everybody, is brought to you by um, The Remarkable Way, a brand new way for you as a leader to be on a learning path every day, every week, working on your leadership development intentionally, on and on. And you can learn more about that by going to kevineikenberry.com forward slash way, W-A-Y. Now, this last segment, Steve, is what I call the fast break. I have three ideas. I think they're going to be really super softball easy for you. But I have three ideas. I'm going to share the idea, just your chance to say off the top of your head, whatever you want to say okay. about it short, not super long, but whatever you want to say about these three ideas. Are you ready? Sure. First one is succession planning. Just think about it at the front line. Don't stop succession planning at the executive level. Start with succession planning at the technical level and uh, worry out that at this, as well. It's at least as important. I think I told you it was going to be easy. Second one is leadership development. Say what good looks like. Tell, point at the leaders who are leading in the right way for your culture, for your company, and for your time, and do not be ambiguous about it. Be crystal clear. These guys are doing this the right way. These women are doing this the right way. If you're looking for what good looks like, look at them. Uh, that takes, takes away a lot of the mystery. And lastly, organizational change. Organizational change has to have an end so the biggest challenge I see in organizational change is the lack of a clear end point and a way to measure done. Shoot for that and you will demystify what change is all about and you'll take away people's anxiety for by a long shot. So everybody um, who's listening, I, I, I often will call out to you, there's the thing that made this whole conversation worthwhile. And while there have been several, there's the one, everybody. Like if you just take that one idea from here, um, you know, it's, it's interesting, and I'm not going to come up with the name off the top of my head, Steve, but one of my guests last year, I believe it was Paul Cummings. And even if it wasn't, everyone, you go, go listen to my conversation with Paul Cummings. I believe it was Paul where we talked about the power of finished, right? And we, we didn't talk about it necessarily in the context of change, but it certainly applies there. And I'm going to give Paul credit. I hope it was him. Um, but the, the idea that organizational change has to have an end is and that's super Super powerful. So now shifting gears. So all the stuff that you're doing today, you're in Omaha. Hopefully for the weekend, you'll be in Seattle. You work with clients around the world. So the question is, what do you do for fun, Steve? I'm a big hiker. So my kids and I, my family, my friends, we're, we're outdoors. In the Northwest, you can be outdoors year round. And so that's definitely what we do for fun. As long as you have a raincoat. Okay. And um, so what... <laughs> But it's something, Steve, that you're reading these days or something you've read recently that people might find interesting. You know, I'm of an age where a lot of my friends and family are dealing with aging parents. And we're reading a book uh, called uh, Being Mortal by uh, Atul Gawande. And I, I totally recommend it. It's a, it's a fantastic book that just uh, speaks to end of life stuff and uh, very practical stuff. To, it's, I, it's, my, it's my kind of book because it's very practical ways to help families through that. So it's not a business book or anything else. Not, not an easy read, but it's definitely a smart and good read. And I, I share it with my own mother and we, it's caused some great conversations to help us prepare. Well, thank you for helping us end on a positive note, Steve. No, <laughs> but, but in all seriousness, that's, that's great. I appreciate that. And you know, uh, no, no reason at all to apologize for not being a business book because you know, um, we are all human beings and not just business beings. And so that's really great. So now the question you've been wanting to ask, wanted me to ask the most for the whole show is okay, where can we learn more about you and your work and obviously the book, et cetera? Sure. My website is stevetroutman.com and uh, you can get all kinds of information there, but I have a regular column in cio.com and uh, that's another place some people pick up my information. There's, there's a lot of uh, my blog and there's a lot of information up there. Tons, tons of writing. I write all the time. So um, just Google me and you'll get lots of information as well. Yes. And it's Steve Troutman, T-R-A-U-T-A, or excuse me, T-A. I can't, let me start again, everybody. T-R-A-U-T-M-A-N. And, and of course, if you, you can go to remarkablepodcast.com and we'll have all those links, links to the book, all of the stuff there for you. Um, so now I have a question for all of you listening. And that is the question I ask every week. I'm not tired of it. I hope you don't get tired of it either. And that is now what? What are you going to do with this? We said at the start that perhaps today's episode was a little different. Uh, although at the end of the day, we really talked about our teams and our organizations and our talent. And so the question is, what from our conversation today will you take and do something with? Not just something that was 
interesting, but something that was practical that you can take action on because there was a bunch of it. Uh, as Steve said, he's Mr. Practical. And that's what I love about him taking such a uh, nebulous set of ideas and making them practical, making them actionable for us. One of the reasons, Steve, I wanted to have you here. So, so Steve, thanks so much for being here. It was an absolute pleasure to visit with you today. My pleasure, Kevin. Thanks for having me. It was, it was great. And hey, everybody, we're here every week. So you might as well come back, right? Every week right here, another episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. And if you, we'd love for you to join the conversation, get updates on what we're up to, have a hand in how this podcast evolves. And you can do all of that by joining our Facebook group. Just go to remarkablepodcast.com forward slash Facebook to get all of the details. So again, we'll be back again next week with another episode. Hope you'll join us then. Thanks, everybody. And we'll see you then.